Hello everyone and welcome to British Murders, a true crime podcast that focuses exclusively on British murder cases with an occasional glimpse at horror movies. I'm your host as ever, Stuart Blues, and this is part two of the season three special. As with last week, this episode's original script and research were done by my good friend Fern, the former host of the Evidence of a Crime podcast. The podcast is no longer an active podcast, sadly I might add, but please visit evidenceofacrime.co.uk so that you can read some of Fern's recent articles as that is what she's focusing her time and attention on now. As with part one script, I have converted Fern's very professional writing into my own style so that you as an audience aren't completely thrown off by it. In last week's episode, I discussed with you the events leading up to the death of six-year-old Ellie Butler, whom this two-part special is focusing on. This week, in part two, I'll discuss the events that occurred in the aftermath of Ellie's death. If you skipped last week in order to binge both episodes simultaneously, then I praise you for your patience. If you haven't listened to part one yet, though, please go back and listen to that first, as it will provide you with the full background story of this tragic case. As you know, I don't often give content warnings on my show, because, like I've said, this is a true crime podcast, but this one, like last week's episode, really does warrant one. This episode contains graphic details of serious head injuries and child abuse resulting in death, which some listeners, parent or otherwise, may find extremely upsetting. You have been warned. As always, let's break the ice a little bit with my opening icebreaker section, which I simply call Dad Facts. This is the portion of the show where I draw a random card out of a Father's Day pack my daughter got me a couple of years ago, which will contain, or should contain, a fact that every dad is supposed to know. So far, I don't think I've known any of them, which doesn't surprise me. So what I'm going to do is, I've kind of shuffled these already. I don't want you guys to have to listen to the shuffle, but you can, for the sake of the audio. And I can assure you it's a David Blaine-esque style shuffle. It's legit. So let's pick out a card here, the top one. I can't remember which week this is. I think it's week five. Who knows? Who cares? Okay, dad fact number whatever. Under the rule of Peter the Great, great, great. (laughs) Under the rule of Peter the Great, facial hair was discouraged and men with beards were taxed an an extra, even, 100 rubles a year. So I have a little bit of a beard. Bit of a, they call it fashionable stubble, I think, because, well, it's in fashion. I wonder what rubles converts to. Let's have a look. So I've just had a quick look on Google here, and it says that 100 Russian rubles, I'm assuming this is the same currency for Peter the Great, my history isn't that good. That's about 99p, I think. 0.99 pounds, that's 99p, right? I'll pay a quid a year for my facial hair. Another very, very useful dad fact. If you're lost in the jungle or you're on Bear Grylls the island, I'm sure knowing that men would have to pay 100 rubles every year if they have a beard under Peter the Great would help you survive the night. Another one of those next week. In fact, no, not next week because that is a special. So we'll wait till season four to bring this back. Maybe I'll have a jingle by then. With that out of the way, let's get into this week's episode, The Tragic and Preventable Murder of Ellie Butler, Part 2. On Monday, October 28th, 2013, at around 3.45pm, a 999 call was made to the London Ambulance Service. It was made by six-year-old Ellie Butler's parents, Jenny Gray and Ben Butler. The call lasted 15 minutes, 14 minutes 59 if we're being specific, and it's so difficult to understand. Both Jenny and Ben were shouting and extremely upset, which sort of distorted the line. It made it difficult for the operator to understand what the hell was going on, but the operator's side of the call is very clear. The full call is available to listen to on YouTube. I have put a link within the show notes of this episode to that video if you do want to give it a watch. If you can figure out what they're saying, then you're better than me and the police operator. To summarise, Jenny and Ben basically explained that Ellie was laying flat on her back and not breathing. They were given clear instructions by the operator with regards to how to perform mouth-to-mouth resuscitation and to check Ellie's airways for any blockages. One thing which got to me was when the operator asked how old Ellie was, and both parents initially said seven, 
but then Ben said, uh, six or seven. Ella was in fact six years old at the time of her death. I mean, she was due to turn seven in a couple of months, but as a parent, you would still refer to your child by their actual age. To me, that kind of spoke that maybe that's how much they sort of didn't care, but maybe they were just in an uproar and thinking, shit, we've got bigger things to worry about faking this whole ambulance call than actually worrying about how old our daughter is. Now, when the ambulance service arrived at the family's flat in Sutton, London, they discovered six-year-old Ellie Butler collapsed on the floor. Statements made by the family's neighbours noted that Ben was clutching the couple's other child, who again, we won't be naming throughout this episode, while silently watching the paramedics on scene attempting to resuscitate Ellie outside. One neighbour described Ben as looking as white as a sheet and said they'd never seen that look on somebody's face before. Ellie was then taken to the major trauma unit within St George's Hospital, which is a teaching hospital in Tooting, London, where she was sadly pronounced dead just minutes after her arrival. Ellie's younger sibling travelled with Jenny and Ben to the hospital later that same day and was placed into the care of the hospital staff. They asked Jenny and Ben for their permission to examine Ellie's sibling, but they both refused. As a result, an emergency protection order was put in place and Ellie's sibling was taken back into care where she was medically examined. According to Citizens Advice, an emergency protection order is used in exceptionally serious situations if a child is feared as being in imminent danger. Anyone can apply to the court for an emergency protection order and it gives limited parental responsibility for the child to whoever applies for the order. The parental responsibility is limited to whatever is needed for the child's welfare and the right to remove the child, or alternatively prevent their removal, from where they are now. An example would be if you're a family member who has serious concerns that a child is being abused, you could apply for an emergency protection order. The child in question, who was just four years at the time, had some bruising on their back which was deemed to be non-accidental. Later that evening, a police spokesperson issued the following statement. Police were called by London Ambulance Service shortly after 15.35 hours on Monday 28th October regarding a six-year-old girl found collapsed at an address in Sutton. She was taken to a South London hospital where she was pronounced dead at 16.01 hours. Next of kin are aware. A post-mortem examination will be held on Thursday 31 October. A venue is to be arranged in due course. Enquiries continue into the circumstances of the death which at this early stage is being treated as unexplained. A 33-year-old man has been arrested in connection with this investigation and remains in custody at a South London police station. For anyone in the army or who deals with 24-hour timing, I've no, am I saying that right? 1535 hours or would it be 1535? Again, is it 1601 hours or 1601 hours? Let me know. The 33-year-old male in question was obviously Ben Butler, Ellie's father. It's a recurring theme that Ellie only seemed to get hurt when she was left in the sole care of her father, and this time it was no different. Ellie was left with Ben that fateful day as her mother, Jenny, was working in central London. Given the previous allegation of abuse against Ben, which, remember, was subsequently dropped, he immediately became the police's prime suspect. When the paramedics arrived at the flat on October 28th, they said that Ellie was cold to the touch and her skin was blue with a quote, boggy mass on the back of her head. Ben claimed that he had left Ellie watching a Peppa Pig DVD, shout out Peppa Pig by the way, in her bedroom. A few hours later, he claims that Ellie's younger sibling found her unconscious on the floor. Ben once more protested his innocence, but this time, the evidence was truly stacked against him. The police were treating Ellie's death as unexplained in the first instance, but the post-mortem revealed an insight into her death which changed how the police would treat the case going forward. Ellie's cause of death was put as being caused by multiple head injuries, which the pathologist believed to have been inflicted with a blunt object or as a result of her head striking a flat surface. The post-mortem also found that Ellie had an untreated shoulder fracture that was inflicted two to four weeks prior to her death. It was agreed that Ellie must have been living her life in a significant amount of pain and would have had limited use of both her arm and shoulder in the weeks leading up to her death. 
Whilst in custody, Ben denied hurting Ellie and answered no comment to all the questions posed to him in police interviews throughout his extended 48-hour stay in custody. Ben was eventually released on bail as the investigation into Ellie's death continued. A full forensic search of their apartment was also carried out and a neighbour who witnessed Ben placing rubbish into various bins on the day of Ellie's death alerted the police. In total, the police gathered seven bags of rubbish that contained significant evidence in relation to Ellie's death. Items such as blood-stained clothes, kitchen roll, rubber gloves and a towel. They also found torn up pages from Jenny's diary, which contained sexual passages about Ben and Jenny's account of Ellie's behaviour, which she called difficult. It never ceases to amaze me that people write such revealing things in their diaries, especially if you're involved in a crime. I get that it's a good outlet mentally, and I've written in a diary before myself, but like I said with the Fanny Adams case in episode 3 of season 2, why not just skip a day if you're going to potentially incriminate yourself? I'm clearly not suggesting Jenny should have done that in an attempt to get away with what Ben and her did to poor Ellie, but it's something that pops into my head whenever I hear about murderers keeping diaries or audio recordings of what they've done. Anyway, both Ben and Jenny's phones were taken in for forensic analysis, along with their other electronic devices. Sadly, the results proved there was even more abusive behaviour occurring within the household, particularly within Ben and Jenny's relationship. I'm now going to read you a few examples of the sort of text messages exchanged between Ben and Jenny. Naturally, these messages contain explicit language and themes, so prepare yourself. In January 2013, shortly after both children had been returned to their parents' care and Jenny had fallen pregnant for a third time, Ben sent her a text which read, I'm disgusted that you're pregnant again and think it's irresponsible and shocking. Had enough of your wit and looks and the trouble you bring. Two months later, he sent a text to Jenny that read, I don't want this life. As for kids, your dream, not mine. How dare you leave them on me? I never wanted this, and then I am left with them. On March 19th, 2013, shortly after Jenny had terminated her pregnancy, Ben said, Keep going on about dead babies, you mental cunt. You ain't dying, so fuck off. You decide if you want Ellie and her sibling or not. You decide, because you have left them too much. This is not right. Later that same evening, Ben sent another message which read, Fuck you, you cunt. Nobody leaves me with kids. Nobody expects me to look after kids I didn't want. A few days later, Jenny sent Ben a text which gave an insight into the effect his abuse was having on her. It read, You really show your hate towards me to a deep, deep level. I should hate you for all the eight years of terrible stuff, way worse than anything you say. Won't ever be able to get pregnant again. You saw to that. Why do you have to lie and become a victim when I have medical evidence? Jenny constantly appeased Ben and repeatedly apologised to him for her behaviour, reminding him of how much she loved him. Theirs was the definition of a toxic relationship. On August 5th, 2013, Jenny sent a text to Ben which read, I didn't do anything to you. I was rushing to put them to bed as they don't get in bed by themselves. Please don't push me away. It was not meant how you thought at all. It was said to make them hurry, nothing else. I won't use that again to hurry them. I am sorry. I just wanted to come back down, and they were messing around. You haven't dealt with it for a while. On August 23rd, 2013, Jenny sent a text to Ben which read, I really do want you more than anything I ever wanted, even my kids. The abusive text continued over the following months and became significantly worse in the weeks leading up to Ellie's death. On October 18th, 2013, 10 days before Ellie's death, Ben sent the following message to Jenny. I can't cope anymore. Woke up in a rage already. Been in this place so many times. My hands are shaking. One more mistake, I'm going to lose it. You're pushing my hate. On March 11th, 2014, Ben was brought back into police custody after they had gathered all of the available evidence and concluded their investigation. He was charged with murder and child cruelty. On March 13th, 2014, two days later, Ben appeared in the dock at the Old Bailey where he was denied bail. As he was led away, he blew a kiss to Jenny. 
After many setbacks and issues behind the scenes, the trial of both Ben Butler and Jenny Gray finally began at the Old Bailey on April 19th, 2016, a full two and a half years after Ellie's murder. During that long delay, Ellie's grandma, Linda Gray, who, along with Ellie's granddad Neil, had practically raised her, was diagnosed with cancer. As the trial approached and Linda's condition worsened, she expressed that her wish would be for the trial to continue without Jenny, her daughter, knowing about her death should it occur. Jenny had been completely disowned by Linda and she didn't want anything to delay the trial further. Sadly, Linda lost her battle with cancer on the first day of the trial and never got to see justice for the granddaughter whom she loved with all her heart. As the trial began, Ben pleaded not guilty to the murder and child cruelty charges put against him. Of course he did, why wouldn't he? Jenny also pleaded not guilty to child cruelty, but admitted to perverting the course of justice. They sat side by side as the trial unfolded. Case prosecutor Edward Brown QC began his opening statement by giving a summary of what the jury was going to hear over the coming weeks. He said, Ben Butler was an angry, violent man with a short fuse. The makeup of the man dominated his and his family's domestic life. The evidence will demonstrate him to be consistently teetering on the edge of a violent loss of temper. The court heard that six-year-old Ellie had significant fractures to her skull that were similar to injuries received in a high-speed car crash or a fall from a significant height. Her injuries were not consistent with a short fall, such as off a bed, or a simple accident. She also had fingertip bruising around her jaw and a shoulder injury that had gone untreated for almost a month. The court then heard about the injuries Ellie had sustained as a newborn baby, with professionals initially believing that Ellie had been shaken by her father. Edward Brown then painted a picture of the toxic relationship the parents shared by using the text messages and internet searches made by Jenny, as well as reading excerpts from her diary. Jenny's internet search history contained things such as I am with a bully man who beats me and tells me I am ugly and fat and hurts me all the time. Magic spells to make him love me again. Urgent spell to make him be sorry for hurting me. Desperate times if you're looking online for spells. In further text messages between the pair, Ben referred to Jenny as a dog whore and an ugly bitch. When Jenny told Ben that she loved him and would do anything for him, he replied by calling her a joke. He also repeatedly sent texts to Jenny expressing his hatred for their children and how he resented being forced to look after them. Look at the language used there. He felt forced to look after his own kids. What a nasty piece of work. The court also heard of a note that Jenny had written which documented 10 things she believed to be wrong with Ellie. Some of the things included were that Ellie told lies and that Jenny felt her to be untrustworthy. A reminder here that she's talking about a six-year-old girl her own daughter. Edward Brown then shared his own opinion of what happened the day that Ellie died, based on the evidence available. His view of what happened was that Jenny left for work on the morning of October 28th, 2013, and Ben was therefore left on his own to take care of Ellie and her younger sibling. Jenny then sent a few texts to Ben that morning, including, hope you are okay, and lots of people at work and busy, love you. Pretty standard text to send your partner, I'd say. Ben then placed four quick phone calls to Jenny at around 12.30pm that afternoon and according to Jenny's colleagues, something wasn't right. Jenny looked panicked and held her hand over her mouth as she spoke. It was sort of like she didn't want people to see what she was saying like footballers do when they don't want to be seen by the cameras giving away tactics. Minutes later, she gathered her belongings and rushed out of the office without telling anyone where she was going. Jenny was then seen on CCTV flagging down a taxi outside of the office. She told the taxi driver that she was heading to Sutton, around one hour away, and the driver initially declined to take the journey on. Jenny begged the driver to take her and explained how she had a seriously ill child at home. The taxi driver described how he felt sympathy for Jenny as she looked extremely worried, and as a result, eventually agreed to the fare. Jenny arrived home between 1.30 and 2 p.m., she then sent a text message to a colleague telling them that she wasn't feeling well and had decided to go home. Over the next two hours, Jenny put some clothes in the washing machine and Ben took their puppy for a walk. He made small talk with passing neighbours, 
comment in on things like the weather, as we often do in England. The neighbours, though, thought that was extremely odd, as Ben had never spoken to them before. That was also when Ben was observed placing several items into various bins around the estate. After arriving back home, Benny and Jen cut up a cake and claimed they had called Ellie down from her bedroom. According to them, she'd been left in there since lunchtime watching a Peppa Pig DVD. That testimony ultimately fell flat though because the evidence showed that Ellie had been dead for at least two hours when the ambulance was called. The 999 call where Jenny screamed at the operator down the phone, pleading for someone to help her daughter, was all a put-on performance by the pair. Remember, Jenny was once an aspiring actress. Edward Brown then said, For all that time while the defendants busied themselves, Ellie Butler was lying in one of the rooms in that home almost certainly dead. The dreadful reality is that both defendants put themselves before the well-being or dignity of that little girl, with Jenny Gray seeking to protect the man, who you will hear, had significant control over her, emotionally and often physically. In respect of Butler, this is a story of a cynical and considered deception directed by a man acting to save himself. In respect of Jenny Gray, her actions flowed from the abusive and violent relationship she had with Butler and her quite irrational devotion to him. Thus, it is not a simple story of purely abusive behaviour, but rather a more complex story in which the abuse and anger boiled over with terrible consequences and in which each parent failed to act in the way that their clear responsibilities should have dictated. On day two of the trial, the court heard from a neurological pathologist, someone who helps diagnose diseases of the spine or brain, and a forensic pathologist, someone who focuses on determining the cause of death by examining a corpse. Both gave evidence in regards to Ellie's injuries. They agreed that her injuries could not have been caused by an accident. You're about to hear some graphic descriptions of how Ellie is suspected of being murdered, be ready or skip this part if you're likely to be upset by it. The forensic pathologist testified that Ellie's injuries were consistent with her being swung against a hard surface, such as a wall or the ground, or as a result of repeated blows to the head with a heavy weapon. Six-year-old girl, man. Unbelievably hard to hear that. Over the following weeks, the jury heard more incriminating evidence that showed the true nature of Jenny and Ben's relationship. Jenny had written letters of prayer that were found inside the home that said things like Dear Jesus, Dear Beautiful Goddess, and Please Make My Home, Ellie, Ben and I all happy together as a family, make him stop being angry, hateful and violent. She also wrote, Please don't let Ben leave me, but make him learn to like me, and Stop violence and make him want me, and be there at the birth if I have a baby boy. The jury was also shown a clip of Jenny's interview following Ellie's death where the prosecution believed she was using her skill as an ex-professional actress to trick the investigators. The prosecution sought to provide a more accurate image of Ben and the inner rage that bubbled at the surface whenever he faced confrontation or criticism. Shortly after Ellie was killed and he was taken into custody, Ben lashed out at police officers and told them to fuck off. Not the wisest words to say to officers of the law. Ben was also extremely aggressive throughout the trial and often swore at the case prosecutor, the jurors, and even the judge. Honestly, this guy doesn't care. The story will continue after these messages. And now back to the story. A chilling video clip was also found on Ben Butler's mobile phone. The video appears to have been taken accidentally and showed Ellie standing in front of the camera with a black eye and a bandage around her ankle. Ben appeared to be shouting at Jenny in the background, and he says within the video, Don't ask me to do something, which you ain't fucking done, and then sorted it out. Now fuck off. I'll attempt an accent on this one, because this is what it sounded like. Don't ask me to do something, which you ain't fucking done, and then sorted it out. Now fuck off. That's what it sounded like. The jurors then read the note that Jenny had written about Ellie which detailed the 10 things that she believed was wrong with her. The prosecutors were trying to portray the lack of understanding that both Ben and Jenny had in regards to the regular behaviour of a child so young, which may have led to the increased frustrations and violent outbursts when they were unable to control her. The note read as follows. 
It's simply titled, Ellie's Behaviour. Number one, lying. Constantly lies and even for no reason. If you ask her a question, she defaults to lying, then admitting that she lied. She has said Ben said things to me and vice versa, trying to cause trouble. Number two, not doing as she's told. She changes what she is doing, then goes back to doing something she has been corrected for. She does not do things properly. Number three, does not listen or pay attention and you are constantly having to say her name. Number four, constantly answers back when you correct or talk to her. Number five, argues with her sibling and tries to tell them what to do. Number six, constantly manipulative and won't be helpful, does not dress or pull trousers up or put socks on. Number seven, feel you can't trust her and constantly watch her. Number eight, not asked or does not seem bothered about grandparents until bedtime when she isn't allowed her own way. Number nine, she acts like a child prior to her years, sits on the floor in the supermarket, does not listen. Number 10, we feel she is aware that she is doing this. Now, as the parent of a toddler daughter, I can confirm that I've read nothing on that list that I haven't experienced with my own child. I'm sure my fellow parents out there will think, she's talking about my kid there, because that's what they all do. It's standard behavior for children. If you think I'm wrong, parents, let me know, but I'm pretty sure you'll agree with me on that one. The defense then offered an alternative explanation for Ellie's injuries. According to the defense, Ellie would copy the activities seen within the Peppa Pig DVD, such as the title character Peppa jumping up and down on her bed and falling off onto the floor and hitting her head. The defense then cross-examined the forensic pathologist, asking if it was possible that Ellie's head injury could have been caused in this manner. The pathologist disagreed, and they stated, I have seen a large number of head injuries in children. I have never come across a scenario like that, and I have never come across a short distance fall that results in a similar injury. He strongly believed that the bruises on Ellie's throat under her jawline were the result of her being gripped as she was thrown into a wall or slammed against the floor. The court then heard of Ellie's extremely low attendance at school since returning to live with her parents and the excuses that were given to account for this. The excuses given were things such as mum has an interview, sick in the night and sore throat. Despite needing medical evidence to register the absence as legitimate, Ellie's parents never provided any. Court documents also stated that Ben had taken Ellie to her local doctor just days before her death, insisting that he make a referral for Ellie to have her ears pinned back. Ben believed Ellie's ears were too big and claimed she was being bullied because of them. The notes indicated that they believed Ben was probably critical of Ellie's appearance, just as he was extremely critical of her mother Jenny's appearance and weight. It was clearly more of a concern for Ben than it was Ellie. On May 9th, 2016, three weeks into the trial, Ben stormed out of the dock and accused a pathologist of trying to hide evidence by cremating Ellie behind her parents' back. Ben claimed that he was not consulted about Ellie's cremation and did not agree to it. After he swore at the pathologist, obviously, and stormed off, he was returned to the court and told to restrain himself by the Honourable Mr Justice Wilke. The description of this event in the media seems to portray Ben acting this way on purpose to sway the jurors, trying to present the image that he was innocent and that he would no longer be able to prove it. Seems like a desperate man was resorting to desperate measures to me. A 3D printed skull was then presented into evidence for what is believed to be the very first time in British history. 3D printing had been used in trials before but not to show the extensive injuries to a victim's skull and brain. According to 3dprint.com, a digital CT scan and x-ray was used to create two 3D printed replicas of Ellie's skull. The defence argued that the skull should be disregarded by the jurors, but the prosecution believed it to be a useful tool to show the jury the true nature of the injuries inflicted to Ellie's head. On May 13th, 2016, Ben took to the stand and told his version of events. Fair warning here, Ben's lies told under oath might piss you off. He claimed that he thought being a father would be boring, but that after Ellie was born, he realised she was amazing. After Ellie was placed into care following her injury as a newborn baby, he said he was devastated and couldn't understand what was happening. In regards to the day Ellie died, he claims he had gone upstairs and found Ellie dead on the floor with her eyes open, lying next to a stool. 
He admitted that he staged the scene after her death because he knew he would be accused of harming her again. He said her untreated shoulder fracture was a result of her chasing the puppy and falling down the stairs, an excuse he had previously provided in regards to another of Ellie's earlier injuries. He insisted he was telling the truth and did not harm his daughter. On May 23rd, 2016, Jenny took to the stand and described Ben as a father. She claimed he was a devoted dad and their house was not a, quote, house of horrors as the jury were being led to believe. She said Ben's abusive texts came across harsher than they were meant to and that she never felt threatened. She said that Ben didn't scare her and that they were as bad and violent to each other as each other. It's quite clear that Jenny was the victim of domestic abuse, gaslighting, manipulation. She would have stopped at nothing to defend Ben even after they were both placed into custody. During cross-examination, the prosecution said the following to Jenny. You have lied and lied to cover up Butler's violence to you and to Ellie, and you are still lying to this jury. Jenny replied, Incorrect. I swore on the Bible, and I am a Christian, and I would not do that lightly. The prosecutor then said, You sacrificed Ellie's well-being for your relationship with Butler. She took second place. Once more, Jenny replied, Incorrect. I'm not sure if she said it with such sass, but I interpret it that way. In her initial police interview, Jenny claimed to have heard Ellie playing in her room when she got home from work. That was clearly a lie, as Ellie would have already been dead by then. When asked why she lied about that, Jenny said it was to protect an innocent man. The ridiculous of this case knows no bounds. Jenny claimed she was absolutely committed to Ben. She said, Ben is my family. I do love him. We have been through 2007 together. We have been through a miscarriage of justice together and I was always grateful to Ben because he got me my baby back and we have both lost a little girl. Ben was not violent to me and he certainly was not violent to my daughter and I maintain that 100%. He was not a nice boyfriend to me but he was a bloody good dad. He was happy to be a stay-at-home husband. On June 8th, 2016, the jury finally retired to deliberate. On June 21st, 2016, Ben Butler was found guilty of both murder and child cruelty. Jenny Gray was also found guilty of child cruelty and perverting the course of justice. The following statement, and it's a long one, so bear with me, is from the sentencing document, a link to which I will leave in the show notes. Mr Justice Wilkie said, Ben Butler, you have been convicted by the jury of the murder of your six-year-old daughter Ellie on 28 October 2013 and of child cruelty to her in early October. You murdered her in a brutal assault prompted by your evil temper. You struck her head so hard against a flat surface, or hit her so hard on the head with a blunt implement, that, whether you hit her once or more than once, you inflicted catastrophic skull and brain injuries from which she very quickly died. Having been granted care of your two young children, you were totally incapable of coping with the reality of bringing them up lively, mischievous, and sometimes not compliant with your wishes. On Jenny Gray's arrival home, you prevailed her to delay calling 999 until you had completed your arrangements, which, most wickedly, involved hinting that it was she who had been the only adult in the house when Ellie met her death. You arranged the cake charade, you had a clothes wash put on, a display of normality, and in all likelihood to conceal evidence of Ellie's blood on Jenny's blouse, which would place Ellie's death much earlier. You went out, walked the dog, disposed of incriminating evidence, and gave a performance for the neighbours of cheery normality, which would cause them to remember and would serve to confirm the narrative you were constructing. You even involved Ellie's younger sibling in the fiction to discover Ellie and to contribute to the shocking 999 call. You may well, in addition, have inserted the Peppa Pig DVD in the DVD player to assist and support the fiction of her jumping and falling. All of this took some two hours, during all of which you left your dead daughter lying unattended on her bedroom floor like a carefully placed prop in a stage scene. Your performance in the 999 call was not only breathtaking in its level of deceit, but your cruel disregard for any dignity to be afforded Ellie, lying there dead, is evidenced by her body being subjected repeatedly to CPR by Jenny Gray, I have no doubt at your suggestion, all to serve the cover-up. 
In my judgment, this was cynicism and selfishness at an almost unbelievable level. Therefore, you brazenly maintained the lie and obtained that Jenny Gray should do so too until it became obviously unsustainable in its initial form and you replaced it with another set of lies in May 2015, which you maintained to this court. The only sentence I can pass on you for murder is life imprisonment, and I do so. Eventually, Ben Butler was sentenced to life imprisonment with a minimum term to serve of 23 years before being eligible for parole. Jenny Gray was sentenced to serve three and a half years in prison. On the day of the pair's sentencing, Neil Gray, Ellie's granddad, issued the following statement to the media. Our lives have changed so dramatically due to the impact and shock and horror of this event that we struggle every day to deal with the reality of the death of our dear granddaughter Ellie. She was our shining light. Ellie was a very beautiful, bubbly and intelligent little girl who always had a smile on her face and even at such a young age, she was nobody's fool. She was our life and she gave so much pleasure to us and our family too. How we all miss her. Local people, some of whom we did not even know, came to express their sadness upon hearing of her death and we received over a hundred messages of sympathy. This gave us great comfort in our time of mourning. Ellie had many friends in school and the community, all of whom were totally grief-stricken. We have difficulty facing people and people have difficulty facing us and visiting our home. It affects our everyday lives. It was such a great privilege and pleasure to have been Ellie's grandparents and to be able to have loved her in her short life. This goes for our family and friends too. We did not realise that some people could be so wicked in life. Our beautiful granddaughter Ellie, we all miss her very, very much, more than any words can express. Life will never be the same for us again. A serious case review was also carried out by the Sutton Local Safeguarding Board to investigate whether enough was done to prevent Ellie's death and what mistakes were made when returning Ellie to an unsafe home environment. Ben and Jenny's needs were clearly put before Ellie's and the obvious red flags were repeatedly ignored. The conclusion of the review was published shortly after the trial came to an end. In summary, they found the following factors were at play for the failure of this case. The high number of agencies that were involved which made the case overwhelming. The extreme level of avoidance, deception and resistance from the parents who the serious case review says were often evasive, contradictory and aggressive. It states that Ben Butler and Jenny Gray would often resort to threats of complaining about the authorities. The transfer of the case from local authorities to the private social work firm Services for Children who were unaware of the background of the case. The court judgment that exonerated the parents which made it extremely difficult for social services to intervene when issues would arise. They insisted that lessons would be learned from Ellie's case and similar mistakes would not be made again. Despite the serious case review concluding that the court judgment made it impossible for social workers to intervene, on July 7, 2016, the Judicial Conduct Investigation Office announced that they would not be investigating Justice Mary Hogg and her decision to return Ellie to her parents in 2012. Neil was horrified at the outcome, as he believed Mrs Justice Hogg had failed Ellie in every way. Even after he testified about Ben and Jenny's abusive behaviour and warned that Mrs Justice Hogg would have blood on her hands, Neil was ignored. Coincidentally, Mrs Justice Hogg retired just six days before Ellie Butler's murder trial began. When asked by reporters for an apology to Ellie's grandfather, she simply replied, It's not personal. Neil was growing increasingly frustrated with the lack of accountability taken by social services, the family corps and the local authorities. He still failed to understand why Ellie had been taken from him and Linda in their loving home, where she'd been raised perfectly for five years, and placed into a toxic environment where she would be killed just 11 months later. In late 2016, Neil began campaigning for an inquest to take place to fully examine the failure of the authorities in court. He also wrote a letter to Justice Mary Hogg stating, Dear Justice Hogg, to say that Ellie's death has caused complete and utter devastation to us is an understatement. Ellie was our shining light. She was a beautiful, bubbly, intelligent little girl who always had a smile on her face. It will be helpful if you could acknowledge our family pain and anguish, support the need for an inquiry, and simply say sorry. Neil Gray 
It wasn't until March 2018 that the inquest began at the South London Coroner's Court in London. They stated that they would not be considering the High Court judgment and that Mary Hogg would not be on trial, nor would her judgment. The inquest sought to review the decisions made following Ellie's return to her parents up until her death. Over the weeks, the court heard from Ben and Jenny, several officials involved, and Ellie's grandfather, Neil. During his testimony, Neil spoke of how unsupported he and Linda felt, regardless of their special guardianship order. He said that Ellie had expressed that she wished to return to her grandparents' care and that she had asked if she could speak to Justice Mary Hogg to tell her she wanted to live with them. She was told she was not allowed to do so. Neil also spoke of how Linda and he had expressed concerns about the grave danger Ellie faced if she would be returned to the unsafe home environment, but again he was ignored by all authorities involved. Ultimately, Linda and he were pushed aside completely and totally disregarded. On April 10th, 2016, after hearing all of the available evidence and the repeated failings made by everyone involved, the coroner's court found that the local agencies did not contribute to Ellie's inevitable death at the hands of her father. Dame Linda Dobbs of the South London Coroner's Court stated, On the evidence, I am unable to conclude that any acts or omissions by the relevant agencies possibly or probably contributed to the death of Ellie. Shortly after the inquest came to an end, Neil Gray issued the following statement via his solicitor. I wish to make a statement to set out my reaction to the Prevention of Future Deaths report by the coroner, Dame Linda Dobbs, which I have now had the opportunity to read. I am clear in my understanding that the document records recognition of failings that are unsurprising in circumstances in which the independent social workers, S4C, Sutton Children's Services and Ellie's Guardian all accepted that they had let Ellie down. That gives me some encouragement that this inquest investigation may have achieved something. What went so tragically wrong has been exposed to the public, which is what I set out to accomplish. I think that the inquest also achieved some success in also exposing failings in a family court system whose ultimate job is to protect our children. The role of the family court in decisions made or actions taken which inevitably led to Ellie being placed at risk of mortal harm was the elephant in the room throughout the inquest. I would have liked to have heard from the judge herself. I think any input by her in this process would have been invaluable. In fact, any acknowledgement by her, even an informal approach to me by her, such as a letter expressing her condolences to my family, would have been appreciated. That would have been the humane thing to do. I have come to the conclusion with some regret that I cannot take this matter any further. Finally, Ellie may be laid to rest. I still miss her and think of her every day but I think that if important lessons are learned from this tragedy, then her death may not have been in vain. I wish to thank the members of the public and the press who have been so kind and compassionate to me. I also wholeheartedly thank the police and Joanne Early from Victim Support and my legal team at Wilson Solicitors LLP. Neil Gray To this day, Ben and Jenny insist they had no involvement in Ellie's death and weren't responsible for any child cruelty or her murder. They continue to seek to exonerate themselves. Neil still struggles to come to terms with the death of his granddaughter and the loss of his wife. He publicly announced that he has disowned his daughter, Jenny, and will no longer refer to her by her name. He states he will never forgive her for failing to protect Ellie and for standing by Ben regardless of the evidence. He believes Jenny knows that Ben was responsible for Ellie's murder. In the documentary series Britain's Darkest Taboos, Neil emotionally showed the crew around his house and garden. He talked about the various places that remind him of Ellie, such as the corner of his garden where her trampoline once sat and the vegetable patch where Ellie would proudly grow her own vegetables. It's breaking my heart reading this to you, honestly. I can't imagine how hard it must be to hear. Throughout the documentary, Neil would be overcome by floods of tears and it's very clear how much Ellie meant to him. He also proudly showed off Ellie's bedroom at his home, which remains exactly as it did prior to her removal from Linda and his care. He showed the numerous memory boxes full of birthday, Christmas, Mother's and Father's Day cards, which he said he often takes to bed to read through for comfort. When asked why, he said he does it in case she's ever looking down and feels like he's forgotten about her. He said he hasn't and never will. And that concludes this two-part season three special regarding the tragic case of Ellie Butler. Appreciate this has been a long one, as was part one. Again, this is a special, and 
thanks again to Fern from Evidence of a Crime for all the hard work you put into researching this case. Over the coming weeks, I'll have a few other special episodes prior to the release of Season 4. Next week, I'm joined by John from the Reddit on Wiki podcast and my mate Dav as we discuss the double murder-suicide case of former WWE wrestler Chris Benoit. The week after, I'll be joined once more by Lorraine from Once Upon a Nightmare as we discuss the 1987 comedy horror film The Lost Boys. The week after that, I'll be joined by Bobby Holmes of Killer Stories for Killer British Murder Stories Volume 3. I've no idea which American true crime story Bobby will be telling me. She keeps changing her mind, which is pretty standard for her, but it will be an interesting one for sure, I know that much. Season 4 will then commence on Thursday, September 30th, and we'll go back to the normal 15 to 30 minute format as best I can. Appreciate you for sticking through these longer episodes for the special. For more on British Murders, please check out all my social media channels on YouTube. Merchandise can be purchased on Teespring. You can support the show on Patreon and buy me a coffee. Links for all of those are in the show notes. Send me an email, britishmurderspodcast at gmail.com. Send me a DM on Instagram or Twitter or however you want to get in touch on social media. And finally, if you want to leave a review of the show, that can be done on iTunes if you're an Apple user or Podchaser. The greatly appreciated. Increased exposure, you know the drill. But yeah, that's it for the special. And for now, I've been Stuart Blues. This has been British Murders. Thanks so much for listening. Until next time, cheerio.